It is 8 o'clock. It is Tuesday night. Do you know where your DJ's at? I know where I'm at. I'm here with you. Yes, it's another DJ Roundtable show, and we have a special guest today. And uh, we'll get to them just a second or two, but a couple of things so you know for a little housekeeping. Make sure you have any critiques, criticisms, comments, or anything like that you want to ask. Please ask it in the chat area. It's always great to hear from other professionals, as well as if you have anything on YouTube. And again, if you're on YouTube, help me slay the YouTube monster and the algorithm. And make sure you smash that like button, subscribe, follow, and also the bell icon. Then one more thing, do me a favor. Make sure that you share the video with someone else. It could be another DJ. It could be another sound professional. It is greatly appreciated. And I hope that you enjoy yourself with this special episode. Because it's always great when we have guests come in here on top of our, our panel. And tonight we have a couple DJs not here again. Working DJs, they have stuff to do. Families, they have gigs and so forth. So with that said, thank you so much for tuning in. And let's go out the show. Well, first thing first, you can't notice and you don't notice and you don't know who they are. We have the sound couple with us, all the way from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And then, of course, we have a cool thing, a.k.a. Hunter in South Carolina. We have Jeff in North Carolina, Matt out in California, and then Dwayne in Ohio. And then we'll see who else sneaks in here, too. Uh, you know, it's always fun where people come around from different parts of the country into here. And if you don't know the song couple, again, I will put a link in just a second or two here on Twitch. But if you're watching this on YouTube, their link is below. Make sure you go follow them, show them some love, show them that uh, you care, and thank them for coming on the show. They are sound professionals. They do sound reinforcement in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Uh, they are great people. You have Bart and Stacy, and uh, it's kind of fun to watch them, especially their adventures. And I say adventures because they have good long gig logs. They're not the typical DJ gig log, which is like all oh, flash. Look, everything's perfect. No, they're the real world. <laughs> like what I do, when mistakes happen, they show it. And if you watched their last episode, uh, they had a little mistake happen. I'm not going to tell you what it is. But the thing is that uh, it was a good outcome. But again, things happen. It's real world, real stuff. And... They are here tonight to talk about, you know, how DJs can work with sound professionals. Because sometimes you go into a venue, the venue may have a sound system, may have someone like them there who is a sound engineer, or you may be working at a venue or a gig that has a band and they have a sound professional for that said band. Well, I could tell you right now, watching them many a times and seeing them doing things, they have some great ideas, great thoughts, and some really cool gear. And uh, Barton Stacy, go ahead and talk and say a little bit. Well, like I uh, more with what I'm saying about you guys, and tell everyone what you do <laughs> and all the fun things you have. Sure, sure, yeah. So we are a husband and wife couple that actually works together, and that is also an extra dynamic, I guess, is the fact that we we do this as our weekend, mostly weekend type hobby. Uh, I started out in bands years ago and when i met stacy she i don't know did you know that musicians dating a musician was like a lifelong i had uh, no idea what i was getting into <laughs> she didn't have any idea what she was getting into and so after playing in some bands i and being frustrated with some of the sound results we were getting we one band i was in and we acquired a pa system and we had other people running it and we had people coming out and watching us going, you know, yeah, just not sound, you know, what I can't hear this or whatever. And so I kind of took it upon myself to start learning about live sound. And that journey started 20, about 25 years ago plus. And I tried to play in bands and do sound at the same time. There was a lot of conflicts. Being in a band is kind of like being in a family. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to strike out on my own and do this live sound thing. And a little bit at some point, I met Stacy and I had a guy working with me and he, he wanted to move on to other things. And I thought, wait, I got this person right here. So 
I don't know how long has it been, Stacy. Probably fifteen years or so that you we we've been doing this together. Yeah, that part, and then you yeah. know, over twenty from just kind of being the rodeo roadie at yep. the beginning. <laughs> and, yep, and then after all those years, I realized that there's no evidence of me really ever doing this. Uh, we never took any pictures. We never <laughs> really documented all these gigs we were doing. And after COVID. I was kind of looking on YouTube. I seen some people doing some stuff and I went to her and I said, Hey, can we, maybe this is something we can do and, and then prove that I'm actually a sound, I'm a sound guy. And so we started our YouTube channel about, I don't know, a little over three, three and a half years ago now. And it's been, it's been an adventure. Uh, it's been probably I, the videos in some cases are more fun than, fun than, than the gigs themselves and and especially uh when we do have some challenging gigs that that we've we've posted to kind of come back and look at them through a different lens it's been a it's been a big learning experience so documenting these gigs and is not only been you know help you know helping everybody else or helping a lot of other people it's helped us too for sure so been um we we enjoyed a lot so one of the one of the quick questions really quickly is what instrument do you play? I played two instruments. I was a bass player and a, and a drummer. Oh, there you go. And, yep. And so if, if you notice in a, in a lot of our videos, uh, I, I, I think I get a pretty good drum sound and, and I get, uh, I, you know, the bass is there if, if, if all things are working out well, but yeah, that's kind of the, the foundation of, of, of my mix um very important too so yeah no. i um, i i will I, I will tell you this also uh, when i watch stuff and i watch what you guys do um i know that you're using a gopro no using an iphone and a couple other things uh, but the thing is that the uh listening to what you guys capture with the uh recording devices uh, i noticed that the vocals on your singers are nice and crisp and clear and I know a lot of times from hearing bands, be at restaurants or whatever, and it sounds like the singers are muddy. And it's it's one of the things that it's like if they invested some time, and I'm not saying they're bad or whatever, if they invest some time doing stuff and learning to do things properly, it helps. And that's one of the things that's why I wanted you guys on here, because as DJs, uh, you know, a lot of DJs, you know, they, they basically play music and they talk in a mic that you sound like Kenny from South Park. Or they have this bad muddled sound or they have feedback and so forth and so on. So it's one of the things that we could talk hopefully a little bit later on and maybe some sure. tips and tricks you guys have to help, you know, uh, us DJs and make us sound better on the microphone. And I, you know, again, it's, 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 it's one of the things that look at things differently than the way we do. It's always a good thing because... We're looking at one perspective versus like what you're doing when you hit you with multiple people in a band. It could be a three piece band. It could be 10. Uh, it's nice to know that, uh, you know, someone like yourself is taking care of all that. And again, if you haven't watched his videos, you see Bart out there in front doing you know, with his tablet out there, adjusting EQs and adjusting mic levels, standing there in front, either in a field or in a building or in a room, whatever. He's out there and actively doing that during a time when the band is on playing different songs and it's constantly a little adjustments. It's making sure that they sound bright and good and not like basically that they're in a tin can. And that's not what you want. You want that bright, clean sound. And that's one of the things that we all strive for when we do when we DJ is to make sure that people can hear us properly when we talk, as well as make sure the music sounds nice and not uh, you know, overly heavily, you know, digitally, you know, pixelated basically and sound wise and sound bad. We want to make sure that it sounds crisp, clear and sounds natural, not sound like it's, you know, again, Kenny from South Park. So I'm going to start with Hunter here tonight. Uh, Hunter, I know that uh, you've done this stuff with your bands, and stuff, uh, with not with bands, but with the church connecting to professional audio. And it's been a little, it's been a minute or two. Um, is there anything that you had a question on, like, you know, that you can work a little bit better with a professional audio equipment, or is there anything that you need help with? Like, you know, your microphone sound a little better or anything like that, that, you know, maybe you can ask them about that or. Well, um, like, well, uh, go back to when I DJ night to shine. I 
connected to their system. And I feel like there was a lot of reverb echo on their speakers because they were mounted so high. And they sound good when it's all, when I'm on the dance floor, but when I'm on the stages, it sounds echoey. And I don't know what's causing that. Well, first of all, yeah, the perspective really can change depending on where you're at. And if you're, if you're on a stage and you're behind the speakers, it's, and I'm sure a lot of you have have experienced that where it it can you, you're hearing perhaps this the bouncing you're hearing more yeah. of the bounce or the slap back off off the walls yeah. when you're yeah. in front of the speakers you're hearing that sound more directly coming at you but that said I mean I, I think some of our experience of connecting with other systems is that we are kind of and trusting wherever our lines are going that they're doing they're doing what they need to do too as far as like um we, we're connecting to a, another mixer and are they do they have like other effects or weird eqing things going on so typically when we when we interface with another system we just tell we we want to get the right gain structure so the right level so the system is loud enough it's not there's no distortion and things like that but we just we also want to make sure that it's flat so we don't want them to be tweaking eqs and certainly most importantly we don't want any reverb or delay or anything like that turned on and if they're plugging you into an open channel or they may not you know making sure that all that stuff is 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 turned off on that channel you're plugging into and that's that's one of the things also that's when a monitor speaker uh helps as well because you can hear what's coming out if you're behind a large um you know stack of speakers or an array hanging from a ceiling and you're on the floor of the stage that's when you want a monitor you know basically just on your booth out or your monitor out facing you so you can yeah. hear it. so like one of your uh jbls just use one of them connect it onto there and that we can hear what's actually the 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 guests are hearing and it gives you a better idea so that way you're not hearing the reverb going back and forth off the building off the walls off the ceiling off the floor right. off the people well, yeah, the I, main, I see it. yeah well the Go main ahead. problem with that is the mixing pro does not have a booth output it doesn't really you can split well, it, has, it has built-in speakers so i guess i can turn that up and yeah. listen from the from this built-in speakers yeah that, so the, that, that's that's our way so do you do you do you want to hear your? Is it about hearing yourself, or is it about hearing what's really coming out of the mains? Well, it's about hearing what's out of the mains, so I know what the crowd is listening to. But this is a big church, so I guess it's way, way high up, so it's just bounced off the walls and it's on an angle. Sure. Yeah, the room acoustics can really uh, play a big role in in how you're perceiving the sound and if you're not and that's frankly that's part of the that's with our with with the uh, bands we work with that's the reason why the sound person is out front so they can hear it from that perspective anytime you're behind what's being projected to the audience it is more difficult to get a reference point of what's really happening and so if if it's just you then you know if you have a wireless mic going out there and and checking it kind of building that's that's what i do a lot when i'm mixing is we don't a lot of times we don't have a front of house or dedicated front of house mixing position so i'm kind of wandering the room and at some point i can kind of just drift back to the side depending on depending on the situation but i've kind of built a reference point to, but to not have that reference point and just go into it cold and being behind and not really knowing it, it it's it's going to be difficult in your situation or, or any situation if there's a band or or a dj for sure yeah uh, and, at this, yeah, and at this church they have specialty mics where it goes into the lobby and the worship hall at the same time so i can't use my microphone i have to use really? their microphone okay yeah. is it a wireless mic or yeah, it, it, it's a wireless mic, and it's a shore. And it's so. A, can you walk? Can you walk to those different areas and hear it? Then I could. Yep. That's what I would do. 
I mean, any time I'm like, we're doing a wedding and we're, and sometimes we got to feed to another room. I mean, I, I always walk to the areas where the sound is going to be projected and just make sure that it's, it's sounding the way I, I would expect it to. And that's one of the important things is, you know, knowing what you're broadcasting out. And that's, that's some great information, especially with understanding that, Hey, you have to hear it sometimes, especially, you know, behind speakers, you get a false, you know, you may get a false beat or you may get a false sound and we go out front and you're like, huh, I've run to that. I think everyone here has run to that, that, you know, hear stuff behind the booth and then go out front and go like, oh, oh yeah, that sounds better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, frankly, I can't imagine, you know, as a DJ, because uh, I've seen some of you guys are using wedges, but when you're setting up your system and you're testing, you, you gotta be testing it. You gotta be seeing what it sounds like out front right you're i, I mean i do I, okay who, and like who? the balance of your mics and and the music and everything like that even throughout the night because if you're turning things up or making adjustments i would imagine you'd have to walk out and and kind of reassess and and make sure your mix is still balanced well unfor unfortunately dj uh controllers don't have the option to go on to a tablet and <laughs> adjust things oh. so that's the one thing that we're kind of tied to annual, you know, analog kind of connections there and actually tweaking it. Now, I'm lucky to have my wife with me that she will go out there and like, you know, when we test microphones, you hear it, you hear it good. Is it clear? Is it too loud? Is it too, is it tweaked one way or another? And again, she's been doing it for years, but people who are single ops like Jeff or Hunter or Matt or Dwayne who go out there and they you know, are by themselves, it's one of, it's a harder thing to do because they can't talk in the mic and run out there real quickly Definitely. and go, okay, walk around with a wireless mic. Yeah, they could do that very easily and then go back and then tweak it if they need to. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an advantage when you have more than one person that can tweak stuff and they know what's going on. Um, sure. I'm going to go over to Matt in beautiful California in Orange County there. Matt, you like playing with the big toys and the big sound systems and stuff like that. And you like doing the, the big arrays and stuff. Uh, you have any questions for the sound couple that you uh, may run into a problem or something like that? Or, I mean, uh, I don't. So I'm a DJ. I'm not an audio engineer. I don't want to be an audio engineer. I don't want to EQ anything. I don't have that technical skill. I'm not going to get an iPad. I'm not going to get an RTA mic. I'm not going to get any sort of processing. Stuff should sound good out of the box when you buy it. That's why it's so expensive. So why do these companies think that I think it's not really a question for them. It's more just like, I mean, I, I don't trust any JBL product. I would never buy anything JBL or anything made by Harman or DBX. Uh, it's all garbage. So I, I use a crossover. Um, it's actually a Rockville crossover. It sounds way better than any other crossover I've used. <laughs> Amazingly, it's a hundred bucks and I've gone through like six of them cause I drop them or kick them or, they get lost in the box and get knobs turned off and whatnot. But like, I want, I want something that's simple. Like, like I, I what, what would be like a good first step into properly? Cause, cause I do a lot of venues sometimes where there's a lot of glass windows and I know glass is just utterly terrible for bass. Um, and it just zonks all the bass out of the room or I'll do venues where it's a huge vaulted ceiling and there's, you know, echo like crazy and, I want it to sound better, but I also like, I don't want to spend the time investing in a whole, you know, case rack build and processing power and an iPad. Like what's, what's something that I could get that could like quickly tune a system that, you know, is not idiot proof, but a lighter learning curve. Um, well, I think the short answer is, is these right here. Um, like you said, there's a lot of good equipment out there. But the one thing that, you know, like our system, for example, I hear it different almost every gig. It's, it's, it's within a tolerance that I expect, but the environmental factors is something you can't account for. Speaker, speaker placement is, is a huge, can, we've been in the same room and I, I'll say, you know what, I think I want to put the speaker here instead of up on the stage or move, move things a little bit closer if I can, just try different things. And it is 
pretty significant the differences that that can make in how things can sound. So I, I, I mean, personally, I, I rely on my ears. Uh, I don't use RTAs rarely, but I would say between that and knowing at least or understanding a parametric EQ and uh, a high pass filter. Mm -hmm. Those, I mean, seriously, those three things right there, uh, parametric EQ or two things really parametric EQ and, uh, and a high pass filter. Because if you're, if say like, if you're in one of those rooms full of glass and you're pumping, you know, 60, 60 Hertz or so 80 Hertz and you just, and you, and, cause you were outside or you were somewhere else and you just kind of left that stuff up there and you go into a room like that, you're going to, the low end is just going to probably just be way too much for that. So I, I really think understanding the, the, how your system reacts to different environments. And I wish I could say that it's always the same, but it changes mm -hmm. every room. So I, that's kind of where I'm at. I think, um, it's sometimes our system can sound like a, a big, like we're doing a rock. We did a gig a few weeks ago where we were in just huge, huge room and the system sounded as big, you know, I'm like, wow, I was just so blown away. And then there's been other times where I feel like I'm just punching it. And I'm like, why aren't I getting anything? And it's just every room, just the shapes and the surfaces and everything, uh, the band in our case. So the type of music you're playing. And I don't know if you guys like, do you, do you, do you take your music and normalize it? Something do you do it so it's consistent, or do things change a lot between tracks? Uh, that's something that could impact. No, I mean we can. I, I mean I run everything through an analog mixer, just a little Behringer Xenix six hundred two. Um, I just like the sound of the Behringers better than Yamaha or Mackie. Or mm -hmm. I had an Allen and Heath. I had an RCF. I just I like the Behringer sound a little bit better. Um, but I just leave the EQ pretty much straight up and then just adjust things with my crossover. So, uh, you know, I can cut out bass and I could adjust the the crossover point, but um, yeah, it's like, I don't, I have a buddy who's an audio engineer and he does, you know, he's got a whole system with the iPad and the parametric EQ. And uh, I just, uh, I, I'd like to know how that works, but like, you know, when he's like, oh, I think I want to take out this many Hertz at, uh, or take out three dB at, at uh you know 120 or whatever just to cut out a little bit here so uh i don't know i think that's i mean to me that is uh i think you know in your situation you're kind of at an advantage because you have something that somebody already said this is what i think sounds good and then now you're taking it and you're kind of regurgitating it and putting it out again so your, your starting point is is perhaps a little bit higher uh, where I got to deal with uh, bringing a bunch of instruments that all could be different at any gig and then put it all together. Um, so those tools are are really, really important. EQing, like I said, high pass filter. And then the uh, finally, the, the, the 31 band EQ is kind of how you... Um, adjust for the room for for the room acoustics and having that type of precision um especially in low end especially in boomy rooms is 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 a really powerful tool uh, so one of the questions uh, i would have is and i don't think everyone knows what you use for a mm -hmm. sound you know uh you want to explain to everyone very quickly uh what you use for a size of woofers what kind of what brand of products you use uh, for your main system um so we yeah we mostly use personas and that went back to the days when we were we were analog and we were looking for an, an affordable digital solution and personas uh had the had the best offering at the time and then we they came out with some rack mixers and a rack mixer is basically just a console without the physical faders and really since then that has been our primary uh way we do gigs so we we have the mixer we have a 32 channel uh personas 32r rack mixer 
And that is all networked together. And then we have the computer connected to it. We have iPads and whatever you know, other devices that we use to control the mixer. And the, the biggest benefits for us is just it, it, it allows me to, first of all, have that connection with the musicians, which is really important to me. Uh, I think a lot of, you know, if you watch our videos, I am first about the stage, making sure they're, they're comfortable up there. So that type of tablet mixing, I can go up there and listen to what they're hearing and, and or better yet, I can check it. We check everything before even a musician talks into that mic for the first time. We, we, Stacy and I do line checks and then we go through, we, we ring out the monitors and, um, so having that tablet allows me because I'm kind of doing two jobs between front of house and 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 the stage, and that's where the the rack mixer, digital rack mixer, is is really convenient. So we have the digital stage boxes that connect to them, um, which which just allows for us to make we have can have inputs all around the stage, uh, so it's it's more efficient that way. We can change things quicker on the fly. A little bit more. Uh, complexity for sure, but uh, the flexibility is is really it really outweighs that complexity. I think. And what what kind what size subs do you run? So yeah, oh yeah, for the um, for for subs we we run eighteens. So we we have single eighteens, and we can do up to as many as as we need to for most gigs for weddings. It's usually a pair of, of 18s, so two, two 18s in total. And then, you know, for bigger shows, outdoor shows, we can go all the way up to, I don't know, a dozen maybe. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. And then for the mains, we have the Persona CDL-12s, and they're kind of a constant array speaker. So they, they have like a woofer in the middle, and then they have an array of mid-high tweeters in the middle. And that those are the mid high and so those have really we can go up to three if we actually put them on our lifts um and so we can do anything from just a small little venue uh corner little corner stage all the way up to a full like almost i would say near concert system with with the gear we got and your monitors you use on the stage because I know you use in-ear monitors, but also just regular monitors on the stage. What brand is that? And yeah, those are Personas as well, um, and those are uh, they're they're discontinued now. Uh, really, really nice cabinet. It's unfortunate, but they were the yeah the three twenty eights, three twenty eight AIs. So they're like a uh, quad quad system. I mean, they got low mids and highs, and it's it, uh, I can't I can't think of the the technology behind them, but uh, we we work with a lot of bands that want a lot of uh, a lot of monitors. So uh, there, I think there are two thousand watt cabinets. So they're they're pretty serious. Do you want the S? Do you want the SPL is on them? I think they'll go one, probably like one thirty or so. In so that, you in got, that that's pretty that's a pretty good strong amount of sound coming out of there. Uh, of those of those monitors and i've seen a lot of times when you do stuff you have multiple monitors there on yep. a stage and it, it, it's it's just a big system <laughs> and that's where eqing is like an absolute requirement because that that's where you're going to likely get feedback for sure and you know i think we have a video on called ringing out the monitors and just some techniques for that um, because it, yeah, that, that'll make it for a long night. If, if, if you're getting squawks and squeals on stage, we like to try to get that nip that in the bud early during sound checks, if any, um, and then focus on, on mixing front of house, uh, for the duration of the night. And that usually that goes that way. It usually works out well, but sometimes you have one of those nights. And that's, that's the important stuff is making sure I, I know, Matt, you said you don't EQ stuff. But I think that, you know, taking a few minutes and just e at least EQing one set of songs is um, like my go to song for round, you know, here in the room is Metallica's Inter Sandman because you start with guitar, right. then you have drums, you have kick, and then you have vocals. And I like go up till the vocals 
and to get into it. And again, I'm not a Metallica fan, but the thing is that it's a song I go to because I know it and I can start, you know, just adjusting basically the main EQ and saying, okay, is, does this sound okay? Or is this sound like, you know, I need to do something. Is, is the bass kicking too hard? Is there something I need to adjust? And then of course, going through the microphones and adjusting the microphones. Buddy, that's a great point. And so you have certain fixed things when you walk into any venue, if you, if you assuming you're carrying your gear and all that, um, it, it takes it takes time. And for us, sometimes it's really difficult or it's harder when you're working on systems that you've never worked on, you're not familiar with. So you have you have that, you have the room, you have the system, you have the room. You know, anytime there's another variable that is um, uh, unknown, it, it can make things, you know, it can pose extra challenges. But that one thing... I have is I have that song and I have our system and and I know between those two when I turn it on I'm expecting to hear it a certain way and then if now that variable is the room and now I'm taming that variable I am shaping the sound to make it sound the way my ears want want to hear it and it's not going to be it's not going to be exact all the time and sometimes it is, and those are great nights. But when you're in that room full of concrete and glass, you know, we, we can just hope that we can, we hope for the best. That's, and that's, try that's a hard one. It is a hard one. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm going to go to Dwayne over in Ohio. And Dwayne, do you have a question for the sound couple? Something that may, may, you know, may have a question on audio or maybe you have a question on, you know, again, you may have a gig coming up that you're with a band. And you know, what do you need to bring to a professional sound person to be connected to your network? Um, I don't really have a question, but I do. Um, at church, we have, and at school, we have like these hanging um, condenser mics, but it seemed like they really didn't do what I thought they would do. They didn't pick up like I thought they would pick up. So is there anything like, so I know if you, boost the gains and stuff, then you're going to start getting all this extra stuff and feedback. So how, how do you handle that? <laughs> That's a, I, I work at a church on occasion as well. They have the same thing. And, and frankly, uh, I, I sometimes wonder why they're even there. Uh, I think now they, they I, I, I want to say they're, they're working, but whether it's that or a lap they're kind of like the lapel mic situation, they're just really, really hard to to um, get the benefits that you 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 would expect out of them. I think um, going back to what I was mentioning earlier is understanding EQing and and high pass filters. Um, so what what a high pass filter does is is cuts it cuts you at a selected frequency it rolls off any frequency below that so for example with with vocals typically there's no reason to send a vocal to your sub really um you're going to send a little bit but you would typically uh cut a vocal at 100 hertz so then you're not sending the the point is is you want to only send the frequencies that that speaker can actually reproduce, you want to send that to, to that speaker. So the combination of EQing, the, uh, the high pass filter and uh, a crossover is getting that system in alignment. Assuming that's all kind of there, then you're with, with those mics, then you just got to deal with that on, on the channel strip. And if you're, a church is an install. I assume they're always there, right? Yep. Um, so if they're if if they're not performing for you and other people, then I would say there's probably something about the way they're positioned. Um, if it's you, uh, and I don't know if you know it's just you, then it's maybe something you're that you're doing. Um, so if other people are going, well, I, I don't know, they seem to be working for us, but. Um, I think that kind of leads into uh, another question or another um, point here is that we spend, mostly me, but Stacy and I, 
spend many much time outside the gig uh, trying to figure this stuff out. And so my my advice to you would be to not wait for that Sunday service to 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 have it come around again and go, wait, these weren't work, you know, uh, try to try to get in there during the off time and just start playing around with them and see um, what what sets them off and 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 see if there's like if, if, if they could be moved or or something like that, or you just need to tweak something on the EQ a little bit differently. Those that that would be best served outside of of those services, or that would be time well spent. And uh, another question is, um, what kind of like lapel mics would you um suggest getting? Because I I have some, but then I I have like the I know they're cheap, they're cheaper brand, and there was the ones that come with you know the handheld wireless mic, and then the lapel, and then they the headsets. But if I'm going to spend money on a lapel mic, which one would be, you know, you know, what's so funny is we, we went around with this a couple of years ago where I thought I'm going to get a nice lapel mic. I think I, I paid like 800 bucks for this mic. And I kid you not, we bought a, a, a instrument mic, mic system that came with a lapel mic that was a, with, for the whole thing was a fraction of what that one lapel mic uh, costed, cost cost us. Guess which mic works better? Probably the cheaper one. The cheap one. I she was out here. I'm just like, <laughs> tell me. I I think in fact I think we did a blind. I I said just I'm gonna A B these mics and you tell me which one you, you like better. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And you picked the you picked the cheap one. So. All bets are off when it comes to lapel mics. It, seriously, I, I I wish I could say, yeah, you, you, it, it, typically that's the case with any gear and certainly mics. The more you pay, there's usually a reason behind that. But at least in my experience, the, the lapel mic test that we did, we bought three different ones. And um, between the three, the, the, that cheap one that came with this other mic system works the best. But that said, I really like the, the biggest reason why we got those was for ceremonies, for wedding ceremonies. And I really encourage if people are leaning on that lapel, well, could we get, you know, I really kind of push them, try to nudge them to going with the handheld because they just are, they sound better. They're so much easier to work with. And, and we really haven't had to break out that lapel mic. In, in, a, in a year probably and not this year at all so that's been but i know it's happening one of these days somebody i really want a lapel mic and i'll be like oh okay you know but i think uh one of the mistakes that i made with the lapel mics is i've overcompensated with the handheld so i've had people say well i could hear the person with the mic but i really couldn't hear him very well with the lapel so if the lapels kind of doesn't sound as good i i try to balance them out a little bit in volume and just so people because people get you know they they get assimilated to sound and if something's way different it 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 they, they have to adjust so i try to make them more the same and then that it's not so um uh disruptive to people's listening and but if i have to do the lapel um is there a good spot to place them because is it like yeah. under here? Right, right just... in the middle. Yeah, I've had people where they, and, and with some of the ladies, it can be difficult depending on the, what they're wearing. But I've had people wanting to put it off to the side and it then they're turning their heads and then you get that you get that effect too. So I try to get in the, in the middle if I can. And actually close, close to the throat, that seems, because I've had people wanting to put it way down here and um it depends on the on the person but especially for like ladies it seems like it's harder to to pick up that that voice when it's when it's pinned down unfortunately that's kind of where it ha has to go sometimes because some of the uh, i used to do a lot of more corporate av work and that was always that was always a struggle of getting the talent to put the mics where he needed them 
But well, you, yeah, middle is where I'd recommend. It's it's always fun when someone trombones the microphone. They hear their voice and they drop the microphone right away when they're talking, and that's that's always fun. But uh, as someone who uses uh, lapel microphones for every single ceremony, it is a little oh, bit of a struggle. Oh yeah, every single ceremony. So where do you that. find where do you find the best spot? I use uh, from a company called Body Mics, which they're out in uh, New York. Um, I got their microphones. I, they're they're not originally expensive. They have different uh, connectors uh, for Audio Technica, for Sennheiser, and I want to say for sure. Um, so your your hardware part is whatever brand you want to use. I use Sennheiser yep. mostly in Audio Technica, so those are the two brands. Um, but the body uh, the body mic microphones. I found work really, really well picking up. They're omnidirectional. Yeah, I do have to fight the EQ for a little bit and ride the, the fader a little bit with volume, but I get it so it sounds very good. Now, does it sound as good as a handheld? No, because a different capsule and they're omnidirectional, so they're more of a wider pickup versus a handheld, which is a more directional. But um, again, I, it, I, you know, I have 60 weddings a year. I'm using body microphones. You know, body packs probably uh, of the sixty ceremonies, probably sixty of the sixty. There's, I I can't remember last time I used a handheld microphone. The really? um the big thing where I place them usually, I like to hide them as much as possible. So I will put them on the inside of the lapel. I will put it on the inside of the shirt. Uh, I try to hide the microphone so you just have a little bit of the head sticking out to capture. But yeah, if you can, if you can put it in the middle toward the throat that's always the best place but sometimes okay. when people are wearing a white shirt and you have a black microphone you gotta go okay what's going to be better for pictures i'd much rather fight the eq and ride the <laughs> ride the audio up and down a little bit than have that takeaway from that picture so this is this is probably this now you're really close to pro audio at this point right because you're you, this is a live mix are you having to adjust that EQing a lot from from event to event, or have you kind of found that sweet spot and you're able to like like you said before, every event is different. First thing I okay. do when we do Love a ceremony, it. inside, outside, doesn't matter where it's at. We're testing both the microphones. Then after I after I put the microphone on the person, usually the officiant and the groom, I have them stand where they're going to stand at and have them say the national anthem, the alphabet. Uh, count you know to 20 so i do it a few times to just talk you can say the lyrics of your favorite song just talk like you normally talk and i try to make sure and i tell them try and keep your head more straight if you got to turn a little bit just turn turn your body don't tr just turn your head because the fact that you'll miss that cone the microphone trying to pick up just like a handheld mic on a stick you have that cone and someone leans over to tell someone something well they're out of that cone you're not picking them up. So it's, it's a lot of the same battles you deal with <laughs> to deal with every time we have a ceremony, uh, you know, and it's, it's a, it's a hard thing, but it also can be a fun thing. And then again, the pictures, it's, it's one of, it's a great thing. I love how the pictures come out with a couple. It's just so pure. And again, the, the little bit of battle I have to do every single time I do a ceremony, I, I feel it's worth the, the outcome. Yeah, it's interesting that it, it, in in our experience, either that microphone is a big deal or they could care less. We've had, uh, as far as like having a stand and having that handheld in the shots or in the in the ceremony, um, I, I it's not a detail that we are really privy to until we sh show up. And I think they're sometimes they're told that, you know, it's going to be a handheld uh, and, but sometimes they'll, they'll ask, but sometimes they'll like really be particular. In fact, we had one wedding, it was a smaller wedding. They said, no, just take it out. We don't want it. And they just went without it, which I thought was a little bit interesting because the, the ceremony itself kind of suffered as a result, but they did not want anything in, in, in the shot. So, okay. We'll I think one of the big things okay. also is where you set up your equipment at. I always try to set up in the back, your left to right side into the back. And I look at the microphone picking up to cover basically two thirds of the crowd, the front one third, they should hear the officiant and the groom and the bride or the brides and the grooms or whoever's up there speaking. 
they should hear them naturally in that for the ceremony and the back basically three quarters or th uh, two thirds are hearing it coming out of the speaker behind them to fill the area. Now, music wise, yeah, music wise, the whole area should hear the, hear the music, but for the speeches or anything like that, I tried to cover that even like the microphone for like readings. I have a microphone on a stick on the side for readings. People are coming up to it and, you know, it's dead. So they go up there and they talk. Even that, I tried to make sure, again, kind of equal to the output of the lapel microphones, but also, again, I want to cover the back part of it, and I may have a little bit brighter just because the fact that usually the mic off to the side a little bit more to make sure I cover more, you know, cover like around 85%, 90%, but people like right in front of the microphone, I kind of want them kind of hearing the person directly. So it's, sure. again, it's, it's one of those fine-tuning things that sometimes you get right, sometimes it's like just hair off and it's like, oh, it, it bugs you for a bit. But the couple and the customer and the friends and family, they don't hear that little hair that we notice as professionals versus, you know, they're over there like, oh my God, that sounded amazing. Like you're happy. That's the most important thing. You know, how we critique it for ourselves is right. always one of the things. <laughs> and having that um, go back to and, and look at stuff is always fun. It, it's, it's okay. What did I do last time? Okay. Did this, 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 this. And you get consistent at it. It's like anything else. You get used to doing it. You're, you're proficient. Exactly. And I think that's, I will say I'm not proficient with the lapel mic. And part of that is kind of my, that, that corporate gig that I had, that corporate AV gig. I, I was dealing with a little Mackie board, analog board a lot with very limited EQing. And I think, yeah, it was a real challenge. And I, and it just, I was always just really, it was always kind of nerve wracking. Is this going to work for me this time? And uh, so I, in your situation, it looks like you, it's just, you're just kind of, you got it. You got the confidence. I, I yeah, definitely been doing it for years. And I would say the key thing with any time you have a lapel, you definitely need a three band EQ minimum. Oh, because for sure. Yeah, you, you yeah. want that, you want that mid, you want that high, you, you if you got to zero everything out and then start over from scratch. Yeah. And that kind of ties back to, you know, that earlier conversation we had is it just, is, is, is your system fighting you too? Cause, and that's where I think, having your system EQ'd is, is, is important and even more important in that situation because yeah, that you don't want, you don't want to be fighting the system either. And, yeah. um, you know, subwoofers, all of that, depending on where they're located, you don't want to be putting that stuff through your, you don't want to be putting the lapel mic into the subs. So that's where the, you know, the filters or EQing is, is your, is your, is a tool to, to hey. avoid that. One of the things, like I know myself, Jeff, uh, I know Dwayne does, um, and I know that. Well, Matt has the bigger boys, but uh, we use a lot of the uh, the the smaller arrays, the column arrays, or line arrays, the portable line arrays, not the you know lifting into the air, you know, covering a crowd of two thousand people. But when we use like you know either RCF or LD systems and so forth, it, it's one of the things they have a wider cast too. They have one hundred and twenty degrees versus a 90 degree cone for cast. So it's also knowing your equipment and getting used to it and saying, okay, fine, great. How do I adjust for this wider, deeper throw? You know, and that's that's a big thing. You deal with arrays, you know how wide of a cast that is versus a record. And we get away with way more than we should. I've said that. It's like, I don't know how we're getting away with these people walking right in front of the speaker and, not, and it's not squawking. Uh, I think part of it is our gear, part of it is our EQing, and and just a little bit of luck. <laughs> I luck mean, luck goes a long way, and I, I will I will tell you that uh, Jeff over there probably has some great luck. You know he uh, he's done some really great gigs over there in uh, beautiful North Carolina. Uh, Greg, you have a question for the sound couple? Uh, maybe help you out with uh, tweaker, uh, uh, tweaking a little bit of anything, or maybe. Uh, have you ever hooked into a professional sound system to do a gig with a band or with a facility? Uh, no, not really. Um, but let's see, I do have a question about subs. Um, you know, a lot of us, uh, portable DJs, um, you know, we pack what we can get into our vehicle or a van or a trailer. Uh, so we're kind of limited, uh, not only uh, how we can get it to the site, but our budget. So, um, you know, most of us have two tops. 
or two column, column arrays uh, or what have you. For me, a um, couple times a year, I will have a large uh, homecoming dance or a prom where I really need to crank it. And so I have an 18 inch sub and I have two 15 inch subs. Uh, for me, I'm finding that centering those subs right in front of the, uh, the, the you know, the, the DJ setup. Uh, I have heard that that sums the sub, uh, to, that sums them together. Uh, is that true? Uh, what are your experiences with that? Yeah, th that that is true. There's uh, how a sub system or those sub frequencies work. It it's the the frequencies are much larger. The waves, sound waves, are much larger, so they 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 have different, more noticeable. Uh, characteristics when they when they go out into the room say than your 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 mains do uh, I I, I want to as I was talking here earlier I just want to mention a channel that you guys should really check out is is Dave Rat and I don't know if anybody's heard of him here but he is uh, got so many he's a wealth of information on on live audio and he talks about just this very like topics just like this and actually demonstrates you know what happens there's power alleys power lanes and all that and how to optimize systems and and it's he's just he, he he's really good at explaining things in a way that normal people can can understand so that's that he, he has a lot of videos talking about that but yes in general you know people have asked us that too it's like well why why don't you why do you have your subs out on each side of the stage and you know put them in putting them in the middle is is uh is is more they, they work efficiently the answer is yes they they normally it is a more generally a more efficient use of the cabinets however there's more than just you know we take into consideration more than just the efficiency of our cabinets there's the aesthetics of it we we want things to to look nice Typically, that is more uh, comfortable for people, and, and the space is provided. Uh, we don't want our subs to become drink drink uh, drink tables. Um, we don't want them to be a tripping hazard. And then we need to also get the mains up. And if we were to, so the the poles, you know, we mount our mains over our subs. But um, if if the situation accounts for it, and the and the time or the, um, the event, I mean, I think a wedding and one thing that we've, we've really focused on more is aesthetics the last few years. So for like a wedding, we probably wouldn't do that now. And it's in the case of a DJ, the logistics are a little bit different. You're kind of the, that center. So your system is, is with you. Um, so I would, I would, I mean, what was your experience or do you, do you know, or, or have you just well, I've never really put them out to the side um, just because I have an odd number. Uh, you know, I, okay. I originally had two 15s and uh, even when I just had the two 15s, I would still center them. I've never really, you know, had poles. I've always put my mains on, you know, uh, speaker stands. Uh, so I've never really actually put them out, but I have heard that, you know, there's a dead space when you do yep. that right in the middle. And uh, unfortunately for, you know, high school dances, that's where, everyone congregates. So, so I want that, I want to have the biggest uh, bang for the buck right there. So you're saying, you're saying putting it, putting both subs together in the middle is creates a dead spot. No, 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 no. I'm or saying if I put a, them out on the side. Yes. Yeah, yep. You yeah, get power, you get power alleys them. and power lanes, they call them because the, the way the waves go out, you get dead spots and that, you know, there's guys out there that have graphed that all out so you can see how that works. But uh, yeah, one of the guys fire. actually um, not far from you, um, Ben Stoll, has a bunch of a bunch of videos of that on uh, this Jackie News TV. Oh, OK. Uh, uh, on the water speaker placement. And uh, Jeff, what you're talking about is coupling when you take two subwoofers and you put them next to each other in front underneath the right underneath the front of you. And that gives you more base. And then what you do is you then double um your numbers so if you have two you go to four you go to four you go to eight and that gives yep, you more db output. but also the other thing is reversing the subwoofer or putting one out of phase so it gives you a, a different db 
Um, and I've also heard uh, put them in a corner. Uh, sometimes is uh, if that's you know possible for your venue that it uh, it can really you know accentuate that uh, and, that base. And and some of, yeah, if if you, there if you have the time to experiment, there's different things you can do. But I think what you got to you know at, with with the limited time that we most most of us have, I think you just need to kind of come up with a few a, a couple things that you know work like like for example another to, to buddy's previous point there is we we try to put our subs on the ground if we can because if you put them up on the stage you're going to lose some of that efficiency with the low end because the, they don't have it they don't have that floor to couple with and actually it could be more difficult for you if unless you'd like to hear a bunch of you know a low end rumble you know um it could it could make it more harder for you to do to and, and that's one of the other considerations we have for musicians some people like it some people don't but just know that typically if your stage if your subs are up on a stage they're not going to be as as efficient to the audience yeah one, one thing i want to uh, bring up also for me that i use uh for uh, not really tuning but just to see how things sound when i set up is playing um thx deep note um mm. if you if you've never heard of that uh, go to youtube and search thx uh, deep note and that is a great little 30 second uh piece of uh it's not music but it is sound and it goes through the entire spectrum and and it's also it's also pretty cool because people when they're, if there anybody if there's anybody standing around you know uh, or setting up they will stop and look and and turn <laughs> when you're playing that because that's what they use it used to hear at uh, you know in movie openings so, yeah yeah I re yeah and we there's another approach you know pink noise running pink noise through the system which is which is a to, it's not a great sound. It's white, you know, well, it's not white noise. It's pink. There's pink noise and white noise, but running that and, and flattening out your system, you got a reference mic in the room that can be really disturbing to people. And we, we tried that a couple of times, but it's like, you know, it's just that what you're mentioning there is, is, is probably a lot more cool than yeah, <laughs> <this> running. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't run a microphone. Uh, I just use my ears. I'll go stand out in front about, you know, 20, 30 feet and uh, play it. And, you know, I, and I'll see, you know, if everything's sounding decent. So. One of the things also is um, Harvest of Sound out in Boston. Uh, ben still actually has been out there and they started a few years ago. And the first one they did, they brought all the, they had a speaker shootout and they were just playing uh, Pink Noise. So to have these speakers out there and they would adjust with the microphone and point at the speaker and then do the pink noise and flatten it out and then have you listen to the pink noise. And the thing is, people are like, I can't tell the sound because they're not used to that 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 material. So what they did was now they play music, but they 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 when they go through an EQ each speaker, they use the microphone and they pink use pink noise to EQ it, and then they play music through it now. Uh, they've grown a little bit, a couple, uh, ever, and they've grown every year they've done it. But uh, if you want to see a speaker shootout on the East Coast, that is a cool one to go to is uh, Harvest of Sound in Boston. That's coming up, I want to say October. Um, and you want to go out there and go see that. Uh, but it, it's it, it's very hard and difficult, especially again. You know, Jeff wants to have that boom for a uh, you know a school dance, and yeah, it, it, it's you got to do certain things, and that's the hard part is. Having you know that that boom, and again he 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 can't have like you know 15, 18 inch speakers to bring with him, and subwoofers to bring with him. But the thing is, that having what he has and make the best of it. That's the important part. That's exactly knowing how to optimize it. it absolutely. And that's 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 always the fun part. Um, really quickly, a couple of things, people. Uh, have said here, uh, new Picard, which is uh, Kevin. He said uh, his motto is "stuff happens." Um, he also asked about a economical karaoke microphone. Any karaoke setup tips? Uh, this is not for karaoke, but uh, I could talk to you offline about that. Uh, DJ Fire says, "Hello, guys. Hope all doing well. Hopefully, you're doing well." DJ Fire, um, how small of a monitor speaker can you use uh, for singers, etc.? Any band? Uh, any band fine for monitor to use any brand fine for monitor to use um and that would produce something i would ask you guys is there a certain speaker you want to use for a monitor or 
So I what 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 we've seen. Uh, so our monitors aren't maybe the typical of what you would see, and there are reasons for that. But if you're looking at like a dedicated monitor and for vocals, typically a twelve a twelve inch twelve inch woofer in a horn is is pretty standard for you know it does does monitors well uh, for low low instruments or drummers things like that. Then you generally a 15 and a horn is, is a better choice, but yeah. So like if you're a DJ and you, and you, you use a monitor and you, you, you could, if you just are using it to hear your voice, mostly um, that 12, if you're wanting to feel that bass, definitely the 15. And one of the things also is make sure the speaker has monitor setting on the speaker. Uh, Cause that also helps that changes the EQ inside. And that way, it's also uh, putting it down. Now, a couple of manufacturers will actually have you rotate the horn in an orientation that's better for being on a wedge on the side. So that's a good thing. Uh, Harvest right. Sound is December. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, also, he said he'd rather hear Pink Floyd than <laughs> Pink Noise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a harsh sound. And it's basically, it's uh, like not static, but it's kind of like static. It's a... It's kind of a unique sound. If you haven't got a chance to, I'm sure you can find it on the tubes. They have everything on the tubes. So you go. You wanna, you, yeah, you want to drive people out of a room. That's that's what you do. That'll yeah. Make, yeah, make sure you go all the way loud because redlining is headlining. Is remember that if you're not redlining, <laughs> you're not headlining. Uh, that is a joke. Do not redline your speakers and stuff like that. You don't want to do that. That's not a good thing. Uh, you don't want to make people's ears bleed unless you're Matt. Matt loves making people's ears bleed. <laughs> <laughs> we love you matt uh with that said hour has passed already and you know at the end of the night if you're tired i guess yeah you want to get everyone out there get put the last song of night as, as pink noise get everyone out of the, the the event um an hour has gone by that quickly we thank you all for tuning in tonight i'm glad i got a chance to some questions there and uh, hopefully we got some great answers here. Again, this is going to be up on YouTube. Uh, we put it up on Mondays at noon, so you can watch it and have fun. But if you have any comments, critiques, criticisms, or anything like that, put it down below. All the links, I put it up here in the chat for both uh, the sound couple and also a video uh, with uh, Mr. Rat. And his last name is Rat, R-A-T. So, mm -hmm. like, I was... I was like is rat like the band R A T T, but no, it's R A T. So, I was a nickname or what? But uh, I found a video with him on there talking about front of house sound. I put a link in there, and I will put that also on the YouTube's. Um, other than that, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed yourself again. Thank you guys so much for coming on here tonight. Uh, it was great having you guys here. I love to have you guys back here again. I'm sure I'm gonna get a bunch of people asking questions after the show, which always happens. Uh, <laughs> so tonight, I'm gonna actually gonna have. Uh, I'm going to have Jeff take us out tonight. Jeff, you want to take us out for tonight's uh, episode? Sure, buddy. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining in for the DJ Roundtable Show. I hope to see you uh, back here again next week. Until then, have a great week. Peace out.